let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Francisco Zamora Arroyo is Sonoran Institute's director of its Colorado River Delta program with more than 20 years of experience working in the Delta as a researcher and project manager. He is responsible for integrating community stewardship, applied science and local values in an alliance to reform water policy, conserve and restore priority areas and build knowledge and capacity for collaboration between water managers and local leaders. Dr. Zamora works closely with Mexican and US agencies involved in water and land management and spends a good portion of his time in the field working with communities, visiting potential restoration sites and doing field research and restoration work. Take it away. Thank you, Morgan. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you all. Buenas tardes, noches. Uh, I'll be speaking in English, although my native language is Spanish, but I know we have translations. So I, I do have a few slides or, you know, I have uh, some, some uh, sentences in Spanish, but the presentation will be in English. Uh, again, thank you everyone for being here with us. I see we have a lot of people uh, joining, so that's great, I, I love it. So can we go to the next one, Morgan, please? A little bit about Sonoran Institute, about our mission. Our mission is to connect people and communities with the natural resources that nourish them and sustain them. And really, really the key for, for in terms of our, our mission is working with people and communities. And, and why do we do that? And if we go to the next slide, please, uh, I think it, it will show, you know, and you know, I have to show pictures of birds, right? Uh, this is the first one. And when I took this picture, of course, I, I couldn't see the little bird inside the nest, but I, hopefully you are able to see it. And can you go next? There is an, a little animation here. And, and these uh, few words are in Spanish. This is a, it's an old proverb, which, which means uh, what it says is, we don't inherit the land from our parents. We actually kind of borrow that from our uh, sons. And, you know, a few years ago, I heard this proverb and, and to me, it really explains why uh, I am so passionate about nature and connecting people with nature and, and protecting the environment because uh, I think we do have a responsibility uh, to do that and to, if we can actually leave a better place for our sons or daughters or future generations, because we do actually have that responsibility. That's uh, uh, something that I, I firmly, firmly believe and I've been working for many years trying to, to contribute to this. So hopefully I'll be able to show what we have been doing in the Colorado River Delta in the last few years. Uh, next, please. Uh, you know, this is just a map of the basin and it shows that the Colorado River Basin is, uh, you know, most of it, in the US, but a little bit, it is on the Mexican side, just south of Juma and, uh, you know, San Luis, San Luis, Arizona, you can see it there. So several states in the US, two states in Mexico. Next. Why do we have, or why are we working on the Colorado River Delta? Well, of course, water is the main issue. Uh, all of the water of the Colorado River has been allocated. In fact, has been over allocated. So they, there was no water for, uh, for the environment, for the river. And it was being used mainly in agriculture, about 80%, depending on the area. But you know, on average, 80% of the water is allocated for agricultural uh, uses and about 20% for uh, cities for human consumption and human use uh, and nothing for the environment. So that's really uh, the, the origin of some of the issues that we are facing in the Colorado River Delta. Next, please. 
and and this is the result. This is pretty much the end of the river. It no longer connects with the sea, as used to be the case many many years ago. So in, in these few words that I have on the screen, what what it say what it says is that we didn't have an allocation for the environment. And I, I actually explicitly say that we didn't have because now we are changing that. That's part of one of the main goals to be able to secure water for the environment so that we can restore uh, a portion of the Delta and, and recuperate some of the um, wetlands that we lost in the really in the last 50 years, really since the construction of Glen Canyon Dam in 1960s the river has not connected to the sea on a regular basis. Uh, next, please. Um, <clears throat> there, there is a partnership. Sonoran Institute is part of a partnership. It's called Raise the River in English or Revive el Rio Colorado, Alianza Revive el Rio Colorado in Spanish. And this partnership works with many, many other partners in both sides of the border, US and Mexico from federal government, state government, local governments, and of course, with communities, uh, farmers. Um, so it's, it's really a, 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 an effort of many, many people uh, involved in the restoration of the Colorado River Delta. Next. Uh, I mentioned partnership and uh, my good friend, Oswell Hinojosa, uh, uh, I'm, I'm on the left and Oswell is the young guy, younger than me uh, on the right. And he's the expert on birds. He used to spend many, well, with me, you know, 20 years in the Delta, he no longer uh, is, is working in Delta, uh, although he continues to be, you know, uh, uh, advice, advising the work, uh, but he's the expert. But uh, I, I wanted to show this slide because it, it shows you know, and it shows that it takes really a partnership to uh, restore the Delta. And Pronatura Noroeste, Oswald used to work with Pronatura Noroeste and, and myself, we both work in Mexico and began working in the Colorado Delta in 1998. So it has been, it has been over 20, 20 years working the Delta and the partnership with Pronatura and other, and, and other organizations continue. And, you know, my effort was more on, on the management aspect and of course, Oswell on the, on, on the bird monitoring and the, the, he's the bird expert. So I'm not an expert on birds. I'm gonna show a few slides uh, or pictures of birds, but really in terms of, of my, my involvement or Sonani's involvement, and, and this of course complements what other organizations are doing was more on the on the ground restoration management and and you know monitoring monitoring of vegetation and hydrology uh, so uh, you know i just want to mention that next uh, with oswell and of course with jennifer pitt who works with Audubon uh, in 2002 and working with uh, water managers on both sides of the border with the bell of this map, map the map of the possible. And, and it, re is, it really is of the possible because we were, we were very careful to identify those areas that um, had the conditions and, and were priority areas to be, to be restored. Next, please. And I'm, I'm happy to show, and this has some animation, uh, Morgan, if you can just continue to show uh, the animation. There is a biosphere reserve, there are some Ramsar sites, and then we now identify, identify that uh, riparian corridor or that area in kind of pink that shows the areas that we would like to restore and have been working to restore. And then the rectangles that uh, are showing are those particular areas. So our goal is to really create a network. We won't be able to restore all the wetlands that we used to have in the Delta 100 years ago. No but we can restore and, and i think we have demonstrated that in the last few years that we can restore some areas when and when you put those areas together along a corridor the goal is to create a functional corridor 
And it's not only a corridor for birds, for migratory birds and resident birds, for other wildlife. We have, of course, we have the beavers, we have coyotes, we have bobcats. We, you know, it's not only birds, but I, I must say the, the, the main uh, uh, group, I guess, of uh, species that we are trying to restore area for are, are birds. And uh, the map shows, you know, the repair corridor. We also work on the upper estuary. We work on the Hardy River uh, and, and Las Arenitas is another wetland, an important wetland in the Delta. Uh, next, please. Our strategies, we have three strategies uh, and, you know, restore habitat. So we go on the ground and, and, and restore some critical habitat. We renew the connection of people with the Delta. Uh, and I wanna say mainly with, you know, the, the young generations because they haven't experienced the river, the repairing, <coughs> repairing areas. So there is a, a very little opportunities for them uh, before we began the restoration to, to get to know the river. And we are changing that. And then in terms of reconnecting, that's the third strategy, reconnecting the river uh, with the sea. That's the picture that you see on the right side. Uh, on the upper part of the picture, you see the Colorado River. On the lower part, you'll see the sea coming up with the tides. And the idea is to reconnect the river with the sea. Next, please. Uh, in terms of uh, themes or components of the work, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna explain this chart, but basically I, I wanna point out that we are looking about uh, securing water for the environment. We are looking to restore uh, areas and of course habitat for those species, but also looking at community engagement. We wanna be able to create opportunities for uh, people of local communities to participate. And even it's not only local communities because we had have visitors from all over the world. And of course, uh, most of them from, from United States and, and Mexico. Next. Uh, in terms of water, so I'm gonna go really quick in terms of the components, but water, how can we get water for the Delta? Well, one source of water is uh, treated effluent, and this shows a wastewater treatment plant called Las Arenitas, and we have been able to secure uh, through an agreement last year, 50% of the water uh, or the effluent from this uh, wastewater treatment uh, plant, about 11,000 acre feet of water per year. Uh, and there is more that we could do if the capacity of the plant increases. So this is one source of water. Um, and it's, it's, it's really becoming an important source of water, treated effluent. Uh, next, please. And this is just to show that we're actually monitoring that. So that agreement, uh, uh, we, we implement the monitoring of those flows to make sure that the water that has been committed from the wastewater treatment plant is being uh, uh, discharged into the, the river. Next. We're gonna skip that. We're just building another wetland there to improve the, the capacity. Uh, can we go to the next one? Okay, I wanna show this because this shows how much water we have secure for the environmental purposes. And you can see the lanes, the, the baseline is in 2013. And for you know last year, 2019, we have increased in 200% the amount of water. Uh, and we are using this water to restore habitat in along the, the uh, along the main stem of the Colorado River in Mexico. So we have water. We need more water, and we're we're working on securing more water for for this for for the river. Next. Okay, and then that water is a, a key component, and we are talking about not only. Uh, you know, surface water, but groundwater levels is very important for vegetation. And, and this is just to show some of the indicators you know, that, that show the quality of the habitat that we have. And as you can see, we have three sites in 2018, the Sila, Radura, and Cori site. And the quality of the, of the conditions in terms of groundwater are good, excellent, and, and excellent. 
So we have been able to um, improve the groundwater conditions. Next. And um, how much water is reaching the estuary, you know, or how, uh, connecting the river with the sea. And this is another important indicator just to show uh, in terms of water, the water component. We, ha we have seen an increase of, you know, 200% uh, base, uh, or, um, based on uh, the 2014 baseline, uh, an increase of 200% of the amount of water that is reaching the, the estuary. Now, this is very small flow, okay? But it's important. Uh, what I'm trying to show, to show you and, and in, to some extent to convince you is that it can happen. We can do that. We can actually secure water, enough water to restore these uh, priority areas along along the delta and create habitat for birds and other species. Next. Now, we did talk about water. Now I'm gonna show a, a few slides in terms of the habitat that we, that we have been able to restore. Uh, next, please. Okay, in uh, the, the first restoration project, I, I, you won't believe this, in the picture on the, on the top left, it is me and Oswald planting trees. You know, remember the picture I showed you at the beginning? Well, uh, 2002, we were planting the first, the first trees in one of the restoration projects. And it was really working with a local um, uh, users uh, along the Rio Hardy, this particular project. So from the very beginning, the restoration projects were implemented in collaboration with the local users, with local communities and the people. And in fact, we learned a lot from them because they, 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 they knew the area, they had experienced the changes in, in the conditions in the area, and we together began the restoration process of the Delta. Uh, next, please. Uh, I'm not gonna really, you know, explain a lot of this chart. Basically what I wanted, wanted to say is that we have over a thousand, uh, we have restored over a thousand acres of habitat, riparian habitat in the Delta. And this is from 20, uh, 2012, when we established the a national agreement called Minot 2019. So really in seven years, we have restored uh, over a thousand acres and we are working to double that amount in the next few years. Next. This is some of the sites uh, I did mention that uh, this is a partnership. We have uh, different organizations implementing on the ground projects. Pernatura Northwest is one of them. They have this project next. Uh, another another uh, organization is called Restauremos El Colorado. They, <clears throat> they have been working in this uh, site. It's called Chauce. Uh, it's an old meander of the river. It's about almost 200 acres in size, really, really nice and a very important site for uh, in the cottonwood and, um, and willow forest. Next. And, and this is one of the sites of, of Sonoran Institute is called Laguna Grande or, or, or a big lagoon. And, and why big lagoon? Because there is a, actually a big lagoon in one of those in, in, within this, uh, this area and, and here, in Sonoran Institute has been able to restore uh, close to 300 hectares, which is about 700 acres of repairing habitat. Next. And, you know, we continue, the restoration continue. We already have a plan for, for next year under the binational agreement, the minute 2023. Um, and, and we have plans to restore close to 250 acres next year. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just kind of a summary of the different sites and the different projects. And of course, we will go in, in the details on each side, but basically what I wanna uh, point out is that it is a partnership. It is not just one organization, it is, it is a partnership of uh, uh, organizations non-governmental organizations working with uh, the different uh, government agencies on, on both sides of the border and also with universities, University of Arizona, 
the University of Baja California in Mexico, and, and other uh, uh, researchers from different organizations who have been collaborating with us on, on this effort. Next. Okay, you know, a little bit of more uh, on Laguna Grande. And what I would like to just show on this slide is, of course, the green areas are those that have been restored already. The red ones are the ones we are planning to restore next year. And the orange is what uh, is available for uh, restoring the future years. So there is a process and, and you know, we have the land available for uh, increasing the habitat in this particular uh, site or area, Laguna Grande area. And we'll be working on this area for the next, the next few years for sure. Next. Uh, and, you know, basically here it shows all the polygons that uh, how we are building this network along the repairing corridor. Yeah, you see the highlight, the green, the dark green are the ones that have been restored and the light green and, and the purple are, are the ones that we are hoping to be working and restoring in the next few years. So we are talking about here in terms of the length of this riparian segment of the river, more than 15 miles that we are, you know, building a, a network of sites that will connect with other sites on the north and of course with the upper estuary on the south. Uh, next. This is another project you, I just wanna show you because for us it's very important. So now an institute is working with uh, the uh, Kukapa tribe along the Rio Hardy. The Rio Hardy is a tributary of the Colorado River. And they also, we lost a lot of the wetlands along the Rio Hardy. We really don't have much of cottonwood and willow habitat. And we have decided to begin this project working with the Kukapa tribe. They're gonna be actually, they, they did select the site. We are working with, next please. We're working not only with the, the tribe with, with, with the kids, actually, we are engaging the kids and, and uh, the, the new generations in the project. And they will be the ones that will be planting the trees, irrigating the trees. And of course, they will be part of ensuring that, uh, you know, we, we take care uh, of this particular restoration site. So a lot of opportunities for, for involving and, and making contributions to the restoration of the river. Next. Okay, so we got to this question. Hey, where are the birds? You might be asking that uh, because you, you love birds or I love birds too. And I like to, you know, of course, take pictures of birds. That, that's, that's my passion. I may not know the name or be able to identify all the birds, but I like to take pictures of birds. And so I wanna show you some of the, some of the things that we are doing and in terms of uh, the, the different bird species. And again, I wanna emphasize, one of the main goals of the restoration in the Delta is to create habitat for birds. Of course, migratory birds, but also resident birds, uh, 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 land birds, uh, water birds, shore birds, all kinds of birds. I think we have over 370 species of birds in the Colorado River Delta. So here we go. Next, please. Um, you may ask, well, where are the birds? Well, habitat. We are we are taking uh, we are making sure that the habitat that we are developing is a good habitat for birds. And 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 I just wanted to show this slide because the signs we are putting a lot of signs into this. It's not just planting trees here and there. Is doing the research needed to identify the sites to decide what type of vegetation is needed. And of course, then to monitor the changes and to see if we are actually making an impact next. And, and we have been making an impact on the habitat. As you can see here, just to show the quality of the habitat is excellent, excellent, and good. So this tell us that the habitat that we are creating based on different factors, and this is the 
cottonwood, cottonwood and willow uh, forest and mesquite forest versus the salt cedar. So we are changing, we are enhancing, improving the habitat for, for, for birds. Next, please. And this is a metric for birds in terms of diversity, abundance, number of uh, priority uh, species and their richness. And, you know, just let's look at diversity. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And the abundance, you know, we, you know, we're working on it on the quality side, it's excellent. So what I can tell you is that it's working. We are seeing a, an impact on birds. And, and I, sometimes I refer to this as, you know, we, you come to the site and, and, and you see a bird and they are happy. <laughs> they are happy because the habitat is better. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, everyone would like to go and, and, and live in a good, good neighborhood, but they like to live in this enhanced and improved habitat. Next, please. So, you know, you know, Albert's story is something we, we see, of course, in, in the area. Next. Uh, fly catchers, we have different species. Again, I'm not an expert, but uh, certainly I've seen it. And this is a really, really nice bird, uh, uh, Ceniso. Uh, is the ash tore fly catcher. Next. The perlita del desierto. Uh, I show this to my wife and I say, oh, you know, that looks like a, like a drawing or something. Well, no, it's a picture that well, Lupe Fonseca, one of our staff, the field staff took of, of this uh, perlita del desierto. Next. The, the pond wobbler, you know, we have several species of those, or chipe playero. Uh, you, can, you can find it uh, in, the, in the Delta too. There are other species. I didn't have pictures of, or, or, or time to show you all the pictures, you know. Of course, you know, yellow bill cuckoo is one species that we have seen. Uh, and you may know that yellow bill cuckoo really needs a mature and, and, and uh, cottonwood and willow forest, and not only mature, but in, 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 in big enough, you know, to support nesting of the yellow bill cuckoo. We have seen the yellow bill cuckoo is, is not nesting yet. We haven't seen, seen it nesting in the Delta, but, uh, you know, we're we are optimistic and hopefully in the future we'll see We'll see it nesting in, in Laguna Grande. Next. Goldfinch, uh, really, uh, really nice bird. Uh, we call it in Spanish dominico. Uh, very, very common. And, and you see it, you know, uh, this is one of the birds that when kids come to see it, uh, want come to the side and see it, you know, they, they begin to really connect with the birds, you know, the, the color of the bird and, and, you know, the singing of the birds. It's, it's also very, very important for, for, for kids to, to hear and to see the birds. Next. Um, Pro Natura Noroeste, I mentioned uh, Pro Natura Noroeste or partner. They are the ones doing all the monitoring, the bird monitoring and Sonoran Institute has been you know, helping them, but Pro Natura Noroeste has been doing it for, I think, over 20 years or close to 20 years. And here the, 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 it shows on the left picture, they do this uh, every year, the banding on the birds. And, um, you know, it is so important, uh, not only in terms of the signs, but when, when, it hap when it happens, when kids are there, actually, you know, kids come to visit the sites and are able to see the birds pretty, you know, uh, close is, is uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing, an amazing, uh, uh, well, surprise for them to, to be able to see the birds in, in nature. Uh, next, please. Uh, before we go into the estuary, I wanna, I wanna mention a couple of species, or at least one uh, that, that um, 
the I mean, the, no, I mentioned already the yellow bill cuckoo, but the pico gordo azul or the 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 gross blue gross beak or the blue gross beak, yeah, pico gordo azul. That's a, one of my favorite birds. Uh, I haven't been able to take a really good picture of that, so that's that's why I'm not showing it. But that's that's an important bird that um, we would like to see more and more. Uh, one one of the rails uh, you may know. I I saw some people they mentioned that they are from coming from Juma or joining us from Juma. It used to be called the Juma Clapper Rail. They changed the name, but we have that rail in in this area, and and that's very important because some of you may know that the Cienega Santa Clara has about seventy percent of the population of that rail. Well, now through the restoration efforts along the main stem and along the Rio Hardy, we now have, you know, created habitat for the rail. And, and so we are diversifying the habitat for that particular bird. And of course, other birds that I'm not showing here. Um, on the estuary though, we have birds, uh, I mean, short birds mainly. Uh, this map shows what we're trying to do in the upper estuary, again, this particular map, uh, it shows small, so I, I'm not gonna explain really a lot of the map, but basically we are trying to reconnect the river with the sea. You can see it on the pink line, which is along the channel and the kind of the uh, yellow line. Though we have been reconnecting to a dredging, you know, removing some sediments along the river to reconnect, to be able, the little bit of water that is coming from upstream to be able to reach the sea. And the lagoons that you see there, lagoon one, two, three, and four, basically they get water with uh, the tides and sometimes well, a little bit of water with uh, uh, when there is water in the river. But again, we are creating habitat in this particular case for marine species, but also for birds. And uh, next, I think I have a few pictures of uh, you know the work. We use that you know machinery to dredge the river and reconnect the river with the sea. Next, that we're doing in time. Um, oh, this is just an indicator just to show you an, uh, part of the science and the monitoring that we're doing. This is the number of days that we document that the river has connected with the sea. And, and again, you may ask well, why? I mean, the river has supposed to connect with the sea, but not necessarily the river. Again, the Claude River uh, no longer connects with the sea on a regular basis. So this indicator is, is really important because we have gone from 44 days in 2013 to about 60, 162 days in 2019. So an increase of over 200% in the number of, of days that the river is connected with the sea. And of course that has important implications because it's, it improves habitat for marine species, uh, like for fish, totoaba, curvina, uh, but also for shrimp. And, you know, we have documented some of the, the marine species have been able to, to reach upstream areas and, and, and are finding some of the improved habitat. So it's, it's really good. And by the way, I, I mentioned at the bottom of that slide, one of the target bird species, the gorrion, Savanero, the savanna sparrow. This savanna sparrow really likes uh, the, the floor plains and, uh, and it likes the uh, salt grass, which is native of that part of the upper Gulf. So we are also seeing an increased number of uh, patches of salt grass. And of course, we are monitoring to see if we see an impact on the uh, savanna sparrow. Again, an, an important bird species for, in this case, the upper estuary. Next, so we have. Um, I no? yeah, I just want to add. We have about twenty minutes left. Okay, uh, yeah, almost almost at the end of the presentation. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So some short, uh, I mean, short birds. Some pictures from short birds. Very important also for us. Uh, Pro Natura is also monitoring. Uh, species in the upper estuary. Next. And this is just an invitation for everyone to be part of the restoration 
efforts in the Colorado River Delta. You can do it to Audubon, of course, or you can learn more about the underground restorations to Sonoran Institute or Pronatura Noroeste. Um, next, maybe you can, uh, Mola, you can just continue because I have pictures of the, the uh, uh, community work and, and visitors. We have a program called um, uh, uh, Sabados Familiares or Family Saturdays, where we you know, receive visitors from, from you know, local communities, even from Mexicali. But also we go to schools, continue the, the, the slides. We go to schools, I invite the kids to visit, to learn uh, these pictures of the kids. We, we bring uh, the river to the schools first. We make presentations, they get all excited. And of course, later they come and visit. And, and it's, it's really, uh, it's amazing really when they come and, and how they get connected and establish that relationship with the river. And as you know, once you know someone, then you, you begin to care for that, for that, for that person. In this case, by reconnecting them or renewing that relationship with the river, they will be the new students of the Delta. Uh, and here, here they are visiting our, our tree nursery. And then of course, from there they come and participate on the planting days that we do every year. Of course, this year we couldn't do it because of COVID. And we're hoping that, you know, next spring we'll be able to do it. We don't know yet. But if not, there will be other opportunities for you to participate, to contribute, and to be part of this, this effort. Uh, so uh, Morgan, I think I'm going to leave it there. So we have some, uh, uh, leave some time for if there are any questions. Sure, thank you. Um, and yeah, if anyone has questions now, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, well, let me. Okay, we got some a little earlier. Um, so someone was asking, um, we were around slides like 21, 22, with more water into the river to reconnect to the sea. Um, how do you see this or do you see this influencing the water rights at all? And they went on to say, I would think upstream users would or could quickly lay claim to this increased flow. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, you know, there, as I mentioned, there are different ways to secure water for the river. We mentioned the uh, treated effluent, that's becoming very important. But also uh, we have been uh, acquiring some uh, uh, water rights in the Mexicali Valley. And, and of course, all of this is voluntary transactions people, farmers uh, are, are, are willing to dedicate some of the water for restoration of the river. And so that's another way we have been doing this. Of course, Mexico, for Mexico is a priority, the Delta is a priority and has been working with the government of the United States in this financial agreement. That's another way to secure water um, and, and this, when I talk about water, it's some, some of those is a permanent acquisition and some, some is more like uh, for a given amount of time. Uh, and, uh, for example, the binational agreements, the first one was for five years, the second one was for nine years. But the ones that the NGOs or Razor River has been acquiring in Mexico, that's for uh, uh, in perpetuity. Um, and, you know, the hope is that we could secure more in the future. Now, we won't be able to connect the river with the sea every, every day of the year, you know, 365 days, no. And, and we won't be able to reconnect from Morelos Dam, you know, near Juma all the way to the sea. Uh, you will need a lot of water, but we could, with, the, with securing water, we could actually put the water in, in strategic areas. And what I can tell you, we could have the lower portion of the river, the, 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 the lower 40, 50 miles of the Colorado River reconnecting with the sea 
you know, for three months, maybe four months, six months. So we are looking at different options and to be, uh, to be able to be very strategic about how we use the water. Thank you. Um, someone is asking about if there is another minute release planned. Um, do you know anything about this? And could you also give just a short explanation of what the minutes were that, um, that actually involved the Colorado River releases? Right, yeah. So a, a minute is one way to implement the 1944 treaty between the United States and Mexico. And in this particular case, minute 319 and, and minute 323, uh, are, are um, minutes that have a component, uh, an environmental component. Really, it's a minute or minutes to improve water management between Mexico and the US, but there is one environmental component. And uh, in 20, 2014, part of that environmental component, we saw the release of water through Morelos Dam, something, you know, we all refer to the post flow. That happened in 2014. Uh, in, in the new minute 323, we have also uh, committed to uh, dedicate water for the river during the duration of that minute. And we are planning another event for, the, for next year and future years. Uh, we, we are in the process of planning that and approving that. So more likely, we'll see uh, if everything goes well, uh, another release next year, but it's not going to be like the post flow in 2014 because we did actually learn a lot of things from that uh, event in 2014. And this time we are being more strategic uh, about where to put the water and, and, and have a, a greater impact in terms of creating habitat for birds and also, you know, for benef for uh, social benefits of those water releases. So next year we may have one, but it's not uh, for sure yet. Thank you. Um, in terms of the restoration work, uh, how big of a problem is the tamarisk down there, the salt cedar, and are you guys able to stay ahead of it? Uh, it is a, a big problem. Our, our goal is not to eradicate. It will be almost impossible. So what we do is to remove salt cedar or tamaris from uh, restoration sites. So we only remove that if we are going to plant native vegetation. That, that, that's, that has been the strategy. Now, once we remove it and plant, you know, cottonwood, willows, or mesquite, for the first two years, sometimes three years, we had to, you know, do a lot of maintenance and, and, and remove any, the salt cedar will also come off again. So you have to remove that. But uh, our experience has been that once the cottonwood and willows and mesquite are bigger and they, they are well established and that reduces the amount of salt cedar that you see growing uh, uh, at the restoration sites. Thank you. Um, and I have a few questions about what is funding this work, if it's funded through donations, if there's government assistance for the project. I'm assuming that they're referring primarily to the restoration work. Yeah, funding um, uh, is, is very important, of course. Um, the different organizations, the uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, have been able to secure funding to private foundations or, or individuals. So that has been very important. Um, foundations on the Mexican side and of course on the Jewish side. But uh, both uh, Minute, Minute 319 and Minute 323 uh, committed funding for on the ground restoration. And in that particular case, in addition to the private funding from uh, NGOs, uh, there was a commitment or there is a commitment for, uh, for funding from uh, government agencies in, from the federal government in Mexico and the, in the US. Um, 
now of course you know the delta is is pretty stained i mean the, the standard of delta you go from riparian areas uh, other marsh wetlands and the estuaries so there is always a, a need to you know get more support for more to do more restoration uh, and in particular for the future you know when, when we think about rest, restoring the delta uh, what i can tell you is not only planting trees, irrigating the trees, but then maintaining those areas also uh, has a cost associated with that. So um, we're hoping to be able to continue and, and, and securing funding from different sources. So again, private sources and government sources uh, is, is, is very, are very important. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to try and find the slide that shows this a little more. Someone's asking about the farms in the area. Um, oh, okay. Do you know if, uh, well, are you aware of like what kind of irrigation they're using? And I guess I want to kind of broaden that question and ask, um, do you see the agriculture um, around the Delta as um, uh, a negative thing or do you see it as causing any impacts down there? Well, agriculture is it's a, a critical sector, a very important sector in, in, in the Delta and, you know, in other places. So, uh, and uh, what I can share is that in, in the Mexican side, there are more and more uh, farmers that um, uh, as they become aware of the restoration efforts, they need to restore, I think that there is a pretty good understanding about the need to be able to secure water for, for environmental purposes. So what I'm trying to say, the, uh, the challenge is, you know, how, how to do it. And of course, uh, it, it hasn't been easy, but we have been successful in doing that. Now, in, in terms of another important component of the agricultural sector, a lot of the wetlands, or so a good portion of the wetlands uh, in the Delta are maintained by what we call agricultural return flows. For example, the Rio Hardy, half of the flows to the Hardy River uh, are coming from uh, agricultural return flows. That, that's the source of the water. So that's another thing that we are trying to do to be able to secure that. And it, again, it's coming from, from farmers uh, or from agricultural activities. So I think uh, I see more and more that there will be more and more collaboration between the agricultural sector and of course, you know, the restoration, restoration efforts in the Delta. Thank you for that. Um, going back to restoration, um, do you guys announce your work days on your website. And I know that things might be changing in the future um, depending on COVID, but is this something that at least in the past that you have regu regularly done to um, let the public know about the opportunity? We do, we do, and uh, we do it on the website, but uh, you know, we also do it on Facebook. If you go to Sonoran Institute uh, Facebook, and I think, you know, we Sonoran Institute has an office in Mexicali. So we have Sonoran Institute uh, Mexico, Facebook. And, and yes, we, uh, we announce all the reforestation days and, and this program that we have as uh, Family Saturdays. Uh, yeah, you, you will see them. And now because of COVID, we are developing a new platform, a digital platform. So we're gonna bring uh, the river to, to not only to the schools, but to uh, the home of people living, not only in Mexico, but you know, really everywhere with the digital uh, uh, technology. But again, it, our hope is that next year, if not in the spring, but fall, we will be able to uh, have a reforestation day again. Okay. I'm going to ask a bit of a technical question, a policy one. 
Um, this is on the Arizona Reconsultation Committee, um, if you're familiar. Uh -oh. uh, is asking if getting water for the Colorado River, as in the environment, will be a goal for the ARC. I'm not familiar with that, so I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Uh, okay. And I, I apologize, but I, I'm not familiar with that. No worries, no worries. Um, less technical question. Do you guys have a problem with beavers? Um, problem with beavers? Yeah, and I think that they're referring specifically to, like in the picture here, when you're doing your restoration work and planting trees. Right. Well, um, the answer is uh, yes, but um, we also like beavers because they also help, you know, uh, they build the, the, the dams and they inundate some of the areas. So I think we are learning to kind of complement or live with beavers. Uh, we have seen an increase of the population. In fact, we now are hoping to begin a study to look at the beaver population um in, in at least in Laguna Grande restoration area. You know, let me tell you, we, we have we have planted more than 200,000 trees plus plus the volunteers. So uh, you know so far uh, it hasn't been a problem with beavers in terms of taking down the trees. We we have at least now I think plenty of cottonwood and willows. And they are pretty, they love it. They're pretty happy with those. Awesome. I, that's a lot of trees and I'm glad that you guys have an appreciation for beavers. <laughs> um, so jumping back to agriculture here, uh, do you know if there's any issue in terms of pollution when it comes to the agricultural return flows? Or I guess runoff is another way to say it. Um, yeah, good question. Um, of course, I mean, there, there are, um, there is some, of course, because, you know, the, the chemicals that are used in the agriculture, although some of the, you know, DDT ones have been, uh, are no longer in use. Uh, so that's, that's a concern. We have been monitoring water quality uh, along the Hardy River and, and in the upper estuary. And, you know, we haven't seen really any of the, uh, any, any big concerns or issues. Um, something that is helping is the, the, the water travels along the river, you know, so the, the, the system itself helps to, you know, clean the water a little bit as it travels downstream. But we are monitoring, we have a, a, a water quality monitoring program and we are looking at pesticides, we are looking at heavy metals, and of course, the, the physical parameters. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up with one more question, and that's, what is your favorite part of this work? Uh, well, just the feeling of when I see, especially kids or, or looking at birds and, and enjoying the site. There was one kid that came on a, on a, with the school class and she was very shy. We, we, we knew about that or we learned about that because the teacher told us like a week later. And at the end of the day, before she, the, the little kid got back into the bus, she said, I love the Delta and it's really that transformation, you know, what brings me joy and, and more energy because reality is not easy. You know, many of the questions about water, how to secure water and the allocation of water, the salt cedar, the funding. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not easy, but I think, let me, let me finish with this, going back to that old proverb that I mentioned at the beginning, you know. When I was uh, a kid, um, I have a bike and it was just one bike for my brothers and myself. Uh, if somebody borrowed that bike, my expectation was that I will get it back in the same condition 
or better. That's what I want to do, to live a better uh, environment for, for future generations. They, they deserve that. And I think it is our responsibility, or in this case, I'm going to speak for myself. It is my responsibility to do uh, as much as I can to, to, to accomplish that. Well, thank you. I, I resonate with that. And we appreciate you so much um, for having you present with us. Um, it's been a real honor. Uh, thank you, Thais, for your interpretation, um, as well as Isela and Bridget, our captioners. And thank you to everyone that joined us today. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. And I hope you guys have a wonderful night. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I really enjoy it. And, and feel free to contact me in the future if you have more questions or want to learn more about the Delta. Thank you again.